just thank him. We say this all the time, there is nothing like the presence of God. You can't buy it, you can't find it. It's the greatest thing you can ever taste. It's his glory. You ready? And I've only known Abner for a couple years, but the couple years I've known him, it's changed my life. He's an amazing man of God. He hears straight from the throne room of heaven, and he's going to bless your soul tonight. Can we get so loud and crazy? Give it up for our great friend, Abner Suarez. time to keep moving ahead and um, I believe that we are in just the beginning of the the greatest outpouring the United States has ever seen and um, there's a there's a great responsibility we have and uh, I don't think that this is the end I could be wrong but I don't think it is I mean, they thought it was the end when Jesus was around, so he kind of says, I'm coming soon, and it's like another thousand years, so he thinks differently, so, but uh, anyway, do you guys have that video ready? So that'd be great. So I'll just tell you about certain things we're doing. So, I don't normally say this, but I felt to do it. 16 years ago, um, I started this ministry in my parents' basement, and the Lord told me that I would go around the world. He'd open a door no man would shut, and um, he would do things 
that would only he could only get the credit for. And I kind of thought God had lost his mind. I just wasn't tracking with him correctly. And because at the time, uh, I probably had about, I don't know, $600 to my name, and the nursing home wasn't inviting me to minister. And they want volunteers, and they didn't want me. So, so you know, it's like, you know, like, can I come? No, you know, <laughs> we're busy, you know. So, but I had this word from the Lord, and one of the things I, because this is for someone, one of the things I've learned is you say yes to the Lord, walk it out in that day, and then it's only in practice that you can actually learn things with God. You can't learn things just by agreeing with the Bible verse intellectually. You shall know the truth, and when it says no, it's, it's like intimate knowledge of the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So you don't know the truth apart from experience. That's actually part of the challenge of the Western mind because we know things here, and we've not come to know them here, and it's only in here that they change your, your, your world. And so I just began to like walk this out and just would go anywhere that they invited me to preach. And as I began to walk it out, you begin to understand certain things of what the Lord's assigned you to do. And the Lord slowly began to open nations to me. And the goal now in the nations is to do things similar to this, but we, we usually, I've learned now I need time to develop because I see myself as a builder. And I'm telling you this because you guys partner with us, so I appreciate that. Really do. Partners are the backbone of what we do. And so as, we're, as I'm going, working specifically with leaders, this week I was in the Dominican Republic. It was the first time I was there. We met with a leader, and my goal is not to have, uh, I'm good if it's a big group, but I'm trying to identify key leaders who will run with the message and the impartation that God has given me so we can reproduce it in a nation and so nations can be changed. And so oftentimes it takes quite a bit of funds because they're, they're not there yet. Uh, but what the goal is that because of the, the impartation that we're giving them, that they're going to start doing this stuff on their own and they won't need our money anymore. So that's the goal there. And uh, the other part about it is uh, we've partner with a lot of other things, but as I'm going, also I'm looking for different strategic things we're supposed to build in countries, but I've learned that everything is built out of a relationship, and it's very difficult. You cannot develop a relationship too quickly, and so we're working on strategic things in the nations of the earth to actually advance things from one generation to another, and that was just, uh, just a few things. Uh, we have an upcoming event uh, February 26th to the 28th, like six years ago, I did an event at this retreat center, and God just, oh, that was wonderful. It just just broke in, and people have been asking us when we're going to go back, and I just felt uh, to do that, it's going to be a smaller setting. So uh, 26th to the 28th, that the purpose is to connect with other believers and have time to dig into things and things of the Holy Spirit. So that's up there. And then uh, during uh, the shutdown, uh, we just felt like we had this assignment to pray. We started praying six days a week. Now we're praying three days a week uh, because we felt like we had this ongoing assignment and God gave us the name Daniel Company because Daniel was this intercessor who shaped the nation in a difficult time. And uh, so uh, Melissa Plot is here. She leads our intercession. She goes, why don't you stand up, Melissa? And she leads that call. She led it this week. And uh, yeah, you can clap for her. That was a nice golf clap. <laughs> so... If you feel stirred to stand with God's people during this hour, it's every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 8.04. And I've been amazed how it just feels like we're in the same room. I've had um, some significant encounters with the Lord as we've prayed. And we really don't have an agenda except we just come together, what is God doing, and then just begin to pray into that. Uh, I have found that if you can capture what God is saying, it, you don't have to look for the enemy. You'll, you'll destroy the enemy on the way there. You know, I hear some people like, ah, get a devil, get out of my way. I'm not looking for the devil. <laughs> I have enough challenges without looking for him. So I focus on the Lord, and my obedience to the Lord overthrows the devil. But I've learned you can't overthrow the devil unless you're submitted to God. So a lot of people are trying to overcome the devil, and they haven't submitted to God. That was for someone in this room. <laughs>
You know what submission to God uh, looks like? Is like, I hand this situation over to you. And if you're having trouble obeying him in any one area, here's what really helps me. The God who knows everything is talking to the person who doesn't know anything. He just helps you every time, you know. <laughs> yeah, a little laugh there. All right, so, uh, and also, uh, got my book back there. Uh, my other book was supposed to come out, but it's not quite out yet. But I, uh, all, I've, all, I've been on multiple journeys with the Lord and learning things, lots of different things. How many learn something from the Lord all the time? Yeah, three of you, that's good. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> There's more than three. But um, I, uh, I believe that the gospel that I read about in the Bible is not supposed to just change individuals, but it's actually supposed to affect cities. And uh, I, I pray this prayer, and we're getting there. They accused the early church. They weren't large in number, but they accused the early church of filling the city with the doctrine of Jesus. Like, that's good company right there. You know, they, and then Acts 8, verse 8, there was great joy because they were in the city. Yeah. Is there joy because you're in your workplace? Is there joy that your kid is in gymnastics? Is there joy that you're in the grocery store looking nice with a Jesus mask on? <laughs> so that, I, I just believe that there's an expression of God, and I've been talking to God about this years, and he said, it's going to happen. There's an expression of God that we've yet to see in the earth. And um, personally for me, I'm not praying for Jesus to come back anytime soon. I would actually be disappointed because I believe that the, the world deserves a greater expression yeah. of who God is. And God cares about people too, you know? I think that's kind of selfish. I'm happy I'm going to heaven one day. I know I'm getting there, but... This is the shortest part of my existence. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, you know, like eternity. And you get, you, you, the way you'll live in eternity is also defined by what you're doing right now. So, and if you have trouble with obedience, you might not get to the place you want to go. So, <laughs> little thing there. It's true. In heaven, there's no disobedient subjects. Like, <laughs> so it's like if, if you don't want to obey him down here I don't know why you would want to go to the place where everyone's obeying him so we want to get that right down here so got quiet with that one okay um, I just felt from the Lord and I actually felt too that there was healing in the room let's just pause here and um you know, so often things are like rushed and moved ahead and busy lives, and we're all busy, hopefully. But uh, there's just a rest of God in this room. And there's also a work that God just wants to do before I just open up the word. So I just want to encourage you to do something. Just lift your hands there, and if you need to, just shut your eyes. Shut your eyes is not spiritual. It just gives you the ability not to focus on anyone. And um, there's a, a peace. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Peter said, humble yourself under the sight of God and cast all your burden on him. So Lord, we receive the peace of God tonight. We receive the rest of God tonight. We thank you that we're totally and completely accepted in you. And, that, and if we're in you, there's no guilt, there's no condemnation, there's no we didn't do it good enough, and we can boldly come before the throne of grace. And so, Lord, thank you for bringing us before the throne of grace tonight. Thank you that this is Bethel. Thank you that this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the place where angels ascend and descend on the Son of Man. And we trust the words that you gave to Nathaniel that you said if we would believe we would see heaven open and we would see the angels of God ascend and descend. So we believe. And so, Lord, thank you for rest. And now thank you for uh, not just healing bodies, but healing pain and trauma 
and confusion. There's like, um, I feel like at least three people, you just really struggle with confusion, anxiety, and just right here in the presence of the Lord, just be free in Jesus' name. Be free in the name of Jesus. There's um, people in this room, you've, self, you've suffered sexual abuse, and it's like you've handed it over to the Lord, but like that pain and that uh, memory is still there. And I actually see the hand of Jesus just right on your heart, and it's putting its hand right on your heart, and it's healing your heart. So I command your heart to be healed, the pain of that, the trauma of that, the, uh, the constant repetition of even the enemy. I, I just break the lie of the enemy that that was your fault. I break it off of you. And there's many of you, there's great, great regret for choices and um, things you've made, and you just keep going, man, I just wish I would have never done that. I break the power of regret. I break the power of that decision that you made that haunted you 12 years ago. I break that power. And I actually see now, as that power is being broken, I see people's feet being loose to move ahead. There's someone in this room, uh, uh, actually several of you, you like know about the love of God, but it's like um, difficult to actually receive it. You're like, I, I don't get this whole love thing. So I just break every chain in Jesus' name off of you to receive the love and the kindness of God. Uh, there's like five of you, you're in very strong performance-oriented homes where everything was, you were rewarded if you did well and you were punished if you did not. And you've kind of viewed God through that lens and you don't think you do very well. And God just wants you to know he's really pleased with you. He's overjoyed with you. And you can just rest knowing that you're accepted in the beloved. Thank you, Lord. There's like a, a fire of God's presence just rolling through the room right now. The Lord is healing somebody's right knee. The Lord is healing somebody's arthritis. The Lord's healing somebody's sore throat. The Lord is healing somebody's lower back. And there's like a, it's really cool. It's like this big, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, look like it would be an industrial, uh, like uh, like you put a bunch of spaghetti in, but it's just like pouring oil all over this room. So Lord, thank you for fresh oil. There's also rain in this room for those who are tired and weary. Uh, there's someone in this room, you've been looking for employment for at least two months, and within two weeks, you're gonna get a, a job that's coming through. You don't have to worry. You actually, you, the Lord says, don't worry, don't fear. Thank you, Lord. Someone, you have a pain. It's actually a severe pain in your neck, and the Lord is healing your neck, so be healed in your neck. Right shoulder from that athletic injury, it's often even difficult to bring your hand up. The Lord is healing that, so just be healed now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I see like this, um, like it's like in the ceiling of this room. It's in the spirit. And it's like this little crack of oil. And the Lord says there's a little crack in an opening of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that I want to give you. But the Lord says you'll be responsible for unlocking that and letting it. And then it's like, I just see like if you like partner with the Lord. I just see the hands of the Lord just pushing it back and it's like this open heaven. It's like angels. It's like the throne of the Lord and the Lord says, I'm going to hold you responsible for opening that crack and unlocking an outpouring of the Holy Spirit for this region and for the purposes of God. And the Lord would say that this land here is land given for a specific purpose. It's been set aside for purpose. It's been set aside for outpouring. It's been set aside for families to be restored. It's been set aside for encounter. It's been set aside for seeds to go in the ground. And I see like when seeds of prayer go into the ground, it's supposed to go out 
and around and touch and move different things. It's a place of worship. It's a place uh, not just of worship and, and service, but a place of 24-hour worship where, where angels ascend and descend and release things even to the nations of the earth and even to this region for the purposes of God and unlock spiritual realities for people. And so the Lord says, I want to define the group of people in here by encounter. And the Lord would say, if you'll open that door, my desire for you is to go in a place that you have not been before, but it's a place of following my voice. It's a place of following the outpouring. It's a place of following the crowd. And the Lord says, if you'll build it, and if you'll unlock that door as I desire you to do, they'll come from the multitudes and I will, uh, this uh, room that you're in will not even contain the harvest that I want to give you. And I'll bring you disillusioned believers, but also bring you a great, great harvest of people who have never known the name of Jesus and restoration. But the Lord says when they come, they must be disciples, they must be equipped to be sent. Some will connect here as a family and others will go and come just for what I've caused them to receive because this is Bethel. This is the house of God. And Jeff, I, I saw this on you just even as you were sharing tonight. There's a apostolic grace to build and to put into order, but also a greater prophetic grace that the Lord would release on your life. And it's going to come and it's going to like, uh, it's just, there's like this angel behind you tonight. And it's actually just touching your shoulders and it's just activating something actually in your family lineage yes. of prophetic anointing to go and to hear and to do as never before. So 2021 and beyond for you will be defined by hearing the voice of God, but also going into things in the spirit that you have not known or experienced in this next season. And the Lord says, guard that time with me. Um, I don't know. I see a very specific time period that the Lord's going to ask of you. And it'll even stretch you, like, how will I ever do this? And the Lord says, I'll give you the grace to do it because it will cause great, the greatest fruitfulness and will cause you to be focused as never before. So, Lord, just thank you for the open heaven. Thank you tonight for giving people ears to hear and eyes to see. And I, Lord, I, I thank you tonight that we are not alone and that there's a, a wonderful... Uh, several angels in this room with us. And Lord, thank you that Jesus is here. And thank you that you're, uh, we just received the assignment. We received the assignment for everything you're calling us to do here. I'm, I'm telling you, there's a little crack in the ceiling. And if you'll unlock it, you're going to see, whoa, you'll see things you've never seen before. And so Lord, thank you for giving people ears to hear. Thank you for hungry people that come on a Sunday night. And we, we pray, as you've instructed us to pray, to pray for all those in authority. We pray for our president tonight. We pray for every member of the cabinet tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you are aligning this nation with prophetic purpose, and you're also giving wisdom for your believers to know how to pray, to know how to pray, but also to know how to act. And Lord, we thank you that there will not be a civil war in this nation. We thank you that, that peace and righteousness will rule in this nation. We thank you that your people will shine above it all and be a city set on a hill like you've called us to be. And we thank you, Lord, that we are not without. But we do thank you and we declare that there is a healing taking place in this nation, that deep in the womb of this nation, that you're healing it. So, Lord, we thank you for the White House, the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the Senate coming into righteous alignment. And we thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ coming into righteous alignment with the purposes of God. And we thank you, Lord, for, we just thank you that there is an assignment on this meeting. So I just received that. And we ask again for words from heaven that change the earth. Words from heaven that change earth. Lord, you said to us, it has been granted to know the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So open up the word to us, spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, we know that we can't understand anything unless you show it to us. So thank you for understanding. Thank you for wisdom. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. So teach us your ways. Guide us into all truth. And thank you for uh, what you're doing in this room. 
uh, whoever, I'm telling you, whoever that is with the back, the Lord's healed your back. It's healed by the end of the night. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. All right. Um, I felt tonight to talk to you about uh, the subject of the kingdom of God, and it's uh, <laughs> when the Lord told me to talk about that, I was a little like thrown back because it's a very, very broad, broad subject and certainly can't um, cover it in three hours. So um, that's a joke. So <laughs> some of you got real nervous. So I, I can talk about it for three hours, but I won't. So we, we're going to discuss this subject in just a sense. The reason I'm prefacing that is because um, there's, there's often, I call it, uh, tensions and truth. So you can, you can make a statement and there's another side to that statement. So we won't fully uh, cover everything there is. I don't think you can ever do that in one message. But the first point that's really important to make about the subject of the kingdom, and it's a subject that the Lord's been unlocking to me for um, at least 15, 16 years. And he just gave me one phrase. Years ago, I was riding to a meeting writing to hear uh, uh, this great, great teacher that influenced my life. And the Lord just gave me this one subject, and he said, the kingdom of God. And I grew up around the things of God, and I've gone, I've had biblical training, and uh, had different mentors and things like that. And maybe it was taught, I just never heard it, but I never really heard a lot of teaching on the kingdom of God. I heard people refer to the kingdom of God, but they would actually say what it was. But this particular morning, the Lord gives me this phrase, and it's, it, it's, it's something that I've learned that oftentimes the Lord will give you a phrase or say something to you and just let it hang for you, and then it is your responsibility to grab what he said and inquire of him. And it's only your hunger to learn about what he has spoken that will actually give you understanding and actually cause you to be as fruitful as he wants to be in the earth. Because God has this aspect of him called his holiness. And sometimes when people, they, they think about holiness one dimensionally, and they think that holiness, you know, live right, and that's right. But holiness it simply means this, is that God is integrous and just in everything that he does. Like, sometimes when people say, like, you know, why would God send somebody, all this stuff. Like, I, I didn't write the book. I just know he's right. You know? So he's holy and just and integrous. And in integrity, he does not give people understanding or wisdom that they are not interested in receiving, nor are they positioned to do anything with. So... Uh, and, and this is also really important because unless you are tracking correctly and your heart is positioned correctly to walk with God correctly, uh, everything that God has for you is not possible. You can shout all you want, everything's possible, all this stuff. But unless you're shifting and changing and aligning with how he's teaching you, not everything is possible. It's really important because... Uh, Often we can, God cannot violate your mind to fulfill his will in your life. Say that again. God cannot violate your mind to fulfill his will in your life. Think about this. The will of God is, this is just simple, simple example of this. The will of God is for everyone to become born again. But they have to agree with that and they have to align with that. The will of God might be for many people in this room to be millionaires. But if they don't start tracking with God in that area, they will die in that job that they're in thinking that's all God had for them. So not everything is possible unless you are tracking with the Lord. And so this often takes out this kind of, it, it sounds spiritual, but it's, it's, it's honestly, it's just, it, 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 just it, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's like, well, if the Lord, you know, the Lord wants me to have it, it's just going to happen. That's not how this thing works. Or how God relates to people. Just think, again, let's go to a natural example. How many own a home here today? Yeah, yeah. Did you just did you just tell the agent just just whatever you you know whatever you think is good for me? I'll just show up on closing day. I can see some of you are 
you're a difficult customer. <laughs> you looked at everything, you know? And so th the point is that you have to be positioned correctly and hearing correctly. And, it, and it's, not, it's not like you have to be perfect to get it, but there is a positioning of your heart that receives, that, that is able to receive the proper instruction for the Lord. One of the goals of the enemy is to just keep you willfully ignorant of anything that God is doing. Without, or my people are destroyed, right? For a lack of revelation knowledge. So here's the thing. The enemy doesn't care if you come to Elevate every week. The enemy doesn't care if you join a group. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. He j he'll keep you doing that as long as you don't grow and change. And so, uh, I don't know why I got into all that. But the point of that is, uh, God has uh, just over the years been giving me instruction concerning the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is really simple, simply defined. It's defined this. It's God's domain. It's God's domain. And then if you read the Amplified, I love the way it puts it. The kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. God's way of doing things. And so... <laughs> The important first point I finally got to uh, is this. God never intended a religion called Christianity. He intended a kingdom. And the kingdom of God was given to humanity so that we might live as God intended us to live. God has what I refer to a divine design, and it's this. He has a very specific manner in which he created the earth and he created people to function in. And if you don't understand the functions of that, not that I even have fully, I know about this much about God. This much, maybe. But I'm growing every day, doing a lot better than I did last year. And uh, so... The, the, the kingdom of God, if you, don't, if you can't understand how he wants to relate to you, it'll be difficult to receive what God has for you. And so th that divine design always begins in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles tonight, let's turn there actually to the very first uh, verse of the Bible. New King James, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Probably the better translation of that, the Hebrew is because God has no beginning and God no be has no end, is when time began, God created the heavens and the earth. That is really, really important to understand the kingdom of God. Because you'll see, heaven is a created place. And how many know that God is a spirit and he doesn't need a place to live? Now, also, this is just this is a fascinating value to me, is that God, what God is creating is for the benefit of humanity that he doesn't need. <laughs> like, to believe that God needs people is to believe that God needs something outside of himself. You know, I, I know they're sincere, but sometimes people are like, you know, God was lonely, so he had people. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> like, God doesn't need anything outside of himself. That's like an American thought. We think, you know, everything about us and we're important. So, but God has no need outside of himself. So everything he creates is for the b benefit of people to bring him glory, but will also cause us to function at the maximum place. So he creates heaven and earth, and, a, and, and the place that God, God is going to set up the headquarters for his kingdom is heaven, not the earth. But he's going to put man on the earth to represent heaven. Look at Psalm 11. We'll tell you this. Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. So where's the Lord? In his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord's throne is in heaven. It's not on the earth. The Lord's throne is, is in heaven, and the eye, his eyes behold, his, eye, his eyelids test the sons of men. So when time began, God created the heavens and the earth. Obviously, there's tension in what I just said, but he sets up his throne in heaven, so he creates heaven as a place where he sets up his throne. Then he creates the earth. Heaven was a small expression of the heart and the mind of God. Everything in heaven was defined by God. Everything on the earth was defined by God. Nothing in the earth was ever created to be secular. 
in heaven, all are faithful and loyal subjects to King Jesus. Now, look at it, it, the reason we're emphasizing this because heaven serves as a model of how the kingdom of God was supposed to function. In heaven, there's no injustice, sickness, disease, destruction. There's no lack. There's no worry. There's no fear. There's no, there, there's no one in heaven who is not accepted by God. Everything exists to behold God in heaven. Everything exists and finds its greatest pleasure in God. In heaven, we know, worship takes place 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's pretty appropriate. And we know that the elders are going holy, holy, holy. Just one aspect of God. And it's not because they're Pentecostal. It's because they actually see a little different facet of his holiness every time. The, the focus of heaven is the, the, the grandeur and the beauty of who God is. So God creates the earth, and what does he do? We know he speaks it into existence through faith, and then the difference between heaven and the earth, we'll see it here in a minute, is that he puts man as his ambassador to represent heaven on earth. Look at Genesis chapter 1 now. We skipped a bunch of verses there, but here we go. Then God said, and you'll notice here too that when God creates man, he speaks to himself. That's amazing stuff to me. In creation, he would actually speak and release things that actually came from himself. Light, be, where did the light come? From himself. And when he released words, he was also releasing himself, according to John 1. And the word became flesh. And nothing in this world was created without that word. So he actually releases part of himself, but then he talks to himself, and he creates man. That's very fascinating. Why? Because man belongs in God. What did he tell man? He goes, as soon as you disobey, you, you, will, you will die. So man, outside of God, is dead. Let them, there it is right there. Let us, excuse me, let us make man in our image. Image is likeness, resemblance, <clears throat> excuse me, patterned after. Man is not a little God, but man is made in the image of God to be an ambassador of God. Man was created that men and woman, when we speak of man, we speak of humanity. Men and woman was supposed to be the closest expression to God on the earth. The, the way I can illustrate this, and God will often teach me through natural things, it's this, is years ago I, I received an email from my father who escaped Cuba in 1969. And when he escaped Cuba, he, he didn't come to this country with anything. He just came as he was. I've never met anyone, maybe one person, I think, naturally in his family. So I, he sends me this. He goes, this is a farm I grew up with, all my, all my uh, you know, cousins and things. He didn't tell me which one was his, but I didn't have to ask. It looked exactly like I did at that age. So we are not little gods, but if you are connecting and relating to God correctly, you're supposed to be the closest expression to God on the earth. This is really important. This is a theme that God holds man responsible for. In Matthew 25... When people, he's judging people and he's actually going to judge nations. That's why, very, very important. The gospel has an individual expression, but it also has a national expression. According to the book of Acts, it is God who sets boundaries, not Donald Trump. That's right. <laughs> God creates boundaries for nations. He actually says that and puts people in nations, then he holds us responsible for stewarding those nations. As he say, they, he says to him, he said, when, so the, the, the people who came and did the right thing, when did we feed? When would, when would we do this? He goes, when you did it to the least of me, you, di you did it as unto me. So what's he saying? He goes, when you did it, you did it like you were representing me. Amen. Acts the ninth chapter. Fascinating story. Paul is on his, he saw then, I'm spitting now, I know I'm doing good. Paul is on his way to persecute believers. Think about this. He's very zealous for God. He can be zealous for God, but completely insane. I've met those people. <laughs> I think they're on some church boards. So he's on his way. Light, think about it. Light comes. Light 
unlocked religious spirit. He goes to the ground because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. And what the, who starts speaking to him? Jesus. But Jesus is not on the earth. And Jesus says to him, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is not on the earth physically. He goes, oh, you know, I thought I was doing you a favor. So he teaches us this principle. Luke, the physician, teaches us this principle. It's a principle. He said that when you touch someone who's in Christ, or when you mistreat them, it's like you're mistreating Jesus. Now, the other side of that is great, great responsibility. That if you claim to be in Christ, then you have this obligation to be an ambassador. Now, ambassadors, what are ambassadors the natural, right? Foreign, sending, they've been sent to another nation. And when they're sent to another nation, they are to represent the government of the sending nation in a foreign land. And in this foreign land, they have pieces of property. They have um, a, a place where they live. They, the, the, the government who has sent them takes care of everything. Their responsibility is simply to, uh, they never, if an ambassador is, is representing uh, a nation correctly or an entity correctly, they never give their opinion on anything. Well, what do you think about gay marriage? The opinion of my nation is this. What do you think about taking place, what do you think, uh, what do you think about what's taking place in the Middle East right now? The opinion of my nation is this. What do you think about President Trump? The opinion of my nation is this. They never, they are never there to give their opinion. They are there to represent something foreign to that world, to bring the interests of that world into that world. So notice he says, let them he doesn't say, let us. That's even more fascinating. So there's that divine tension in the kingdom that God actually gives man this thing called choice. More powerful than actually God himself moving in your life. That God can be there, God's reality can be there, and you can go, not interested. So he gives you the power to choose that. But man functioning at the optimum level is, com makes himself completely interdependent upon God. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over, all, over the cattle, over all the earth. So notice he reemphasized that point. So who's over the, all, all the earth? Man. Over, uh, I answered my own question. I just did it. Over creeping things that creeps. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to him, be fruitful, excuse me, in the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So man has been created to be an ambassador, and man has been created to uh, govern the earth as God intended it to govern the earth. Now, uh, Genesis 2 now, we pick up this story, verse 4. This is an important part of the story. He's made man and women as his ambassador. Then he says this in, in verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In that day, the Lord made that... The, the earth and the heavens, this is a really important point. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and every herb of the, air, er, uh, every herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to, to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Why am I reading that? Because you'll see that as an ambassador and as a disciple, and as an ambassador and a disciple, dual, you got a bunch of beautiful titles. I mean, you, you're something. You're amazing. There's only with someone like you. You, part of one of the, one of the, your responsibilities, if you are in Christ, if you're in the kingdom of God, is God wants to know, are you handling his world correctly? What are you doing with what God has given you? It's part of the reason he institutes a tithe, in my opinion, is because he wants to know, are you going to touch what belongs to me? Are you going to touch the area of worship that solely belongs to me for me being recognized as your source of everything? Now, verse 8 gets even better. Do you enjoy the Bible? If you don't like the Bible, just get born again tonight. It's true. 
The Lord God planted a garden eastward. There he put man he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord uh, made every tree to grow that is pleasant to sight, to food, uh, and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is one of the, which skirts the whole land of Havilah. And there is gold. Catch that part right there. There is gold. And the gold of the land is good. And bedlam, onyx, and stone are there. What else do we know? Now, if you're really Pentecostal, you say Revelations. But the book of Revelation teaches us in heaven, there is gold. So God puts gold and onyx and stone on the earth. And he puts it on the earth. Why? He's putting part of heaven on earth. And when the world was created, it was created for man's enjoyment for man's pleasure, and for man's discovery. Inside of every person, if they have been traumatized, abused, or, or any of the ugly things that the enemy does, to, it's, a, it's really tough serving the, serving the devil. People are like, it's real hard serving God. No, no, it's really hard walking around with demons your whole life. It's really hard trying to make it your own way. It's, it, that's hard. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He said it's good news. Some of you should get some good, you know, happy. I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm just saying the alternative is much worse. The enemies lie to people. Maybe because some believers need deliverance themselves. So, uh, thank you for the one <laughs> grunt back there. I appreciate it. The earth was created, and this is, this is what I was going to say, put in every human being a curiosity to discover. When the earth was created, no internet, no lights, no running water, not, none of that. And that's just like natural stuff. But we were created to discover things on the earth to make it a better place and to give glory to God. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs, this amazing example of this, he, he had some demons himself, but uh, he did some nice things. You know, he's reading, you read about his life. I remember when I first saw the iPad, I thought, why would anyone want that? I got a laptop. Now I can't go anywhere without my iPad. <laughs> he actually was seeing from an unseen realm, even as an unregenerate man, concepts ideas that would make life better for humanity on the earth. So inside of every person, there is this marking to improve life on God's earth, but many of the things that God wants to give people cannot be found here on the earth. Can't be found at Ohio State. Definitely can't be found in Dr. Fossey's department. <laughs> Throw a little... <laughs> little bomb there, you know. <laughs> That's a different story, right? You can take a position on everything and still be, anyway. So, so there are things on the earth that we're supposed to find, but our greatest find was to be in God, and as we found God under, and, and when you think about dominion, sometimes it's, it's, it's really poorly mistaught in, 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 in even in, among believers. Dominion is this, that under our service unto God, Jesus the King, we are to serve humanity. And when we, we're under dominion of God, we never serve humanity out of our own self-interest. But we rise above and are excellent in what we do. And because of that, the favor of God upon us, people go, do you got an answer for this? So here's some principles of the kingdom that are really important to understand. And this is also important relating to the world. Because often, much of our message to the outside world can only reach them if they're in a bad place. Get that. Very important. Human need is this. Every, every human being has a longing for the kingdom of God. Every human being has it. Humanity longs to live in the shalom that was given at the garden and, in, and only God can find, in, it, only God can give through the kingdom of God. That's why one of the reasons you have all these different 
ideas in the world. Communism, socialism, democratic socialism, which is really insane. And, uh, you know, it's true. But there is, the, there is an image of God functioning inside of people because they want this utopian thing. They're actually in a search for ideas and concepts that can only be found in God. All these different things, and none can satisfy them except what can be found in the kingdom of God. The reason that's important is humanity is not looking for a religion or a subculture of what God intended us to be, but they're looking for a kingdom. All of humanity longs for what was originally given to humanity in the garden. All of creation longed for the restoration of the earth as God intended. Look at uh, Romans, the eighth chapter. For creation waits in eager ex, this is verse 19, for the children of God to be revealed. Notice this. Why does creation wait? It's an interesting question, an interesting statement by Paul. Why does it wait? Because it knows that when people, I don't know how it knows this, but it knows. It knows that when people are in their rightful authority, the earth and the ground comes into alignment exactly as God intends it to be. We didn't read it tonight, but what does God do? He, he creates the world through words. He creates the world through faith. According to Romans 4, he calls things be not as though they are. That's not intellectual. That is, this is what I've decided, and this is what I want to do, and now I'm going to speak it into existence. That same power has been given to us. He speaks the universe into existence, and then Adam begins to name those animals. Those animals don't know if it's Adam or God. They just know those are words that I must follow. So creation comes into alignment when God's people speak correctly. For creation was subject to fr frustration, not by its own choice. Thank you, Adam. But by, the one, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in pains, pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. See, there's something inside of you when you come into the kingdom of God that goes, something is not right with this world that I need to change. Amen. Grown inwardly as we wait for our adoption of sonship and the redemption of our bodies. Now look at John uh, chapter 18, verses 37. This is Jesus speaking with Pilate. Run out of time here. Pilate therefore said, are you a king? I love this. Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, everyone who hears, uh, everyone who hears my voice. So what, what happens? Real quick biblical sketch here. Adam sins. Earth, wrong. Body, wrong. Humanity, wrong. Wrong system now operating in the earth. Satan now has legal right. But every, I love God. He's always got a plan. Yeah, you're, Dan, your worst mistake, he's got a plan. God has planned for all of your stupidity. <laughs> nah, it's, not, it's not to keep doing stupid things, but just when you're done, oh, God's got this. Yeah. And don't turn away, turn towards him. Yeah. Take responsibility. Don't do that shame, blame thing, you know. And just keep tracking on. He'll help you. Old Testament, though, what does he even tell the nation of Israel? He said, he makes a covenant with the man. Then he says, out of you, nations will come. Why? Because he wants his earth back. Right. The earth belongs to the Lord. Psalm 24, the earth is mine. I've given to you. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the earth I gave you? What are you going to do with the time period I put you on the earth for? Jesus was always the promised one, though. And when Jesus comes, he does not come to teach something new. He comes to reintroduce people to what God intended in Genesis 1. He comes 
inside of a man, the perfect seed. And so the focus of Jesus' ministry, preaching, demonstration was the kingdom of God. What happens when he first starts his ministry? Timing. He starts his timing in the seasons. He starts in the right season. He is baptized by John. What was John's message? John's message was the kingdom of God. I don't fully understand all the implications of why he's being baptized, but this is one thing I'm convinced. He is baptizing himself, and he is, he is, he is, he is immersing himself. Why? Because he is identifying with John's message of the kingdom of God. He's saying, I identify he is a forerunner for my message. The kingdom of God was God's original and unchanging intent. It was also the focus of Jesus' ministry. ministry, we know. Four gospels contain a hundred direct references to the kingdom of God. John preached it. Jesus preached it. It was the only message that we know that he preached. Peter, John, and other, other apostles preached. The kingdom of God, we know, he is making an accurate statement. The kingdom of God is not of this world, but its demonstration and expression in this world can be clearly seen. So what we're saying, the kingdom of God is not like, like we, okay, you know, it's like UN, this is where it's headquarters, but it is all over the earth and it begins operating in the hearts of men. Jesus' first message was the kingdom. Jesus, when he taught one of his greatest sermons, the Beatitudes, that's, oh, God, I was reading that today. That is, if, it's like top five of Jesus' moments on the earth. You, you, I mean, if that's the only scripture you had, that'll take you the rest of your life to get that one right. He taught about attitudes of the kingdom and qualities of son or daughter's. When Jesus released his disciples to go into the world, what did he do? He taught them to preach the message of the kingdom. When Jesus taught his disciples about authority that he was given them, what did he taught? He taught them concerning the kingdom. Jesus dies, resurrects, now comes back to earth. Now you'll notice too, though, very important to this idea of how God operates in this world. Jesus does not do any miracles when he comes back in a resurrected body. It would violate God's word in Genesis 1. Why? He's glorified body. He's not like us anymore. What does he teach him? He teaches them things concerning the kingdom of God. Why is this so important to present day? Because what our focus and what our faith is put in is what we produce. John chapter 3. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Notice it's not a message. It could have been, but it's not a message we ever see the gospel writers teaching about. You never hear Jesus said, and Jesus came preaching, you must be born again. He preached repentance. Change your heart because there's a kingdom. Now, yes, do we need to, obviously we need to be born again. Nobody's debating that point. But the focus is not just on getting people born again. The focus is on teaching people God's way of living in this world. It is so, yeah, yeah, you want to, hopefully you want to get people saved. But the avenue by which they get saved is the expression of the kingdom of God in our lives. How many can remember the day you got born again? Yeah, I hope you can. <laughs> Some people, like I have friends, they, 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 like, they literally don't know when they got born again because they've just grown up around the things of God. But the day you got born again does not define how you live today. I am, uh, I'm 42 years old. I know I'm getting younger and younger. When you don't sin, you get younger. <laughs> Seriously. You just keep getting better and better. I, this is probably the best shape I've been as an adult. I feel good. The Lord has been good to me. The Lord will be good to you. You just stick with him. Deliver you of all craziness you have in your life. Live a life of shalom. Trust in God. I went to a restaurant today. I did not pull out a picture of the day I was born to that waiter. Hey, look. I got born again, December 9th, 1977. It's awesome. So you think this guy needs a counselor. Why? Because that day is significant. 
but it does not define my life on the earth. The day you got born again is extremely significant, but it won't define what you're going to get judged by God for. There's a little boy this week with my friend in Dominican Republic, brought his son, Justice Daniel. What a beautiful little boy. I enjoyed spending time with him. He is doing things at seven years old. That's awesome, brilliant. But if he starts doing those same things when he's 15 and 20, we will not look proudly on that. Why? Because there's an expectation that there should be a growth and a discipline beyond the day that Justice Daniel was born. And there's an invitation today across the earth. I've had this theme rolling in my heart all year that if we will position ourselves, keep tracking with the Lord, God will do everything he's told us he would do. But I've also learned this. It's only people who want to, it, even in Luke 2, it says Jesus grew. Are you growing? Are you maturing beyond the day you got born again? Here's what I learned. When I stand before Jesus, all, and here's also really good news. He is committed 100% to you from the day you got born again. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You're like, I'm the price. I'm committed. I keep making bad financial choices. I'm committed to you. you know, I married this dodo when I was 19. And I'm, you know, it's all messed up since then. I'm committed to you. I'm committed to Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. To those who love God and what? Are called according to his purpose. He is 100% committed to you. Everything you would ever need is already provided for. So you come into this unlimited kingdom. He's all in on helping you. And because he, and, and here's the thing, he doesn't actually ever ask you to do something that he doesn't give you the power to do. It's really good news. It's like, I think it's hard. No, he's justified in asking you because he's given you the power to do it. And so because of that commitment to you, when you stand before him, you can't ever say, you didn't tell me. Like, how's that going to work? Gabriel, you forget to tell Abner that in 2020. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. All right. <laughs> you know, well, 2016, that's, that's on you, though. No, it's not going to work like that. And you, don't get, you don't get judged for what you're doing. You get judged for what he asks you to do. Let me say that again. You don't get judged by what you're doing. You don't get judged for coming on a Sunday night. Many of the things we call radical are actually just normal expressions of life in God. It's radical because sometimes so many believers live dysfunctionally that the people who are living normally stand out. So here's some points on the kingdom, then I'll land the plane here. The kingdom of God was never meant to be understood by the casual seeker. But here on the other side, the kingdom of God is worth everything you have. Where is it? One of my favorite thousand verses in Scripture, Matthew 13. Gang, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Some people get mad about 10%. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Kingdom of God is worth everything you have. Second principle, how the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God operates by revelation knowledge, not by sensory knowledge. You're, if, if you are living, if you are in Christ, and you're living a life where you can go, okay, you know, I know I can do this, and God told me to do this, and I have it, I figured out, I'm going to do it like this and like this, you're probably living way, way below 
like way below. The purpose of God for your life is so extraordinary that only God himself could bring it to pass through your trust in him. Like think about God gives Joseph a dream. Now, just back up for a minute. God has no respect of persons. None. None. He actually, he, like, think about, like, he's up in heaven, if you can picture God like this. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're up there with him. And he's going, okay, I have some solutions for what's taking place now in America. I got them all taken care of <laughs> way before this thing started. I need some people to pray. I'm looking for people I can trust to give words to pray correctly. Now I'm also looking for leaders who will speak truth from their pulpits, who will speak life to God's people. Now I'm looking for prophets to prophesy, apostles to put into order. I'm looking for people to capture ideas. I'm looking for people to receive the transfer of wealth. So I'm looking for it now but I need to find men and women because my kingdom can only operate through submitted people. So you'll never understand, though, and you'll never grow into maturity if surrender is not a settled issue. And it's, I'm not talking about, like, you got to have it perfect. I'm talking about that there's this intentional, consistent, persistent commitment that... I'm trusting God. The word of God is my highest standard. The word of God will shape my lifestyle. I will follow his voice. I'm 100% committed to know God. I'm a hun- See, this is another thing that's not very popular with American believers. It's you actually need to intentionally make these choices and pursue it as the highest obligation of your life. It doesn't happen overnight. Disciple means discipline. I think about Olympic athletes, and sometimes I, I, I just watch these interviews, and I wrestle a time as a little kid till I grew up older in college, and I watch some of these guys. There is this complete commitment to this goal that they have for a thing that is going to, fl- it will flee, and it will be, it will have no eternal value. And they are completely focused. They will surrender everything in their life for this goal. And I think, how do natural, unredeemed people have more focus than God's people? Like I said, you don't have to have it like all figured out. You can miss turns. Here's, here's one of the key points I've learned walking with the Lord. Stay the course of fellowship, stay the course of what God's told you to do, stay the course of the fundamentals, because God can even tell you things that you don't quite understand in that moment, but if you stay the course two or three years later, you're like, oh, I got it, boss, now I got it. You don't got it, I will figure it out. You just got to stay the course. It is a positioning of your heart in this moment that defines your next 5, 10, 15, 12, 30 years of your life. Your future is not happenstance. You actually have been given the privilege of creating your future with God. So the kingdom of God operates by revelation knowledge. Kingdom of God operates from the inside out, not outside in. Big difference. World governed by out there, out there, here. The kingdom functions from within. And from what comes from within is to be expressed by what comes out. With the what? With the heart, one believes, and with the mouth, confession is made unto righteousness. So you believe in your heart, and what you believe, you say, and what you say should be expressed by your behavior. That's how the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God operates by revelation knowledge.
trying to find out how to land this plane here. Everyone okay? It's not that I don't have anything to say. It's just what to land the plane with. Look at uh, John, the third chapter. John chapter 3. Pick up this story and just for the sake of time, verse 3. Jesus answered and said, he obviously he's talking to Nicodemus, <clears throat> Nicodemus, excuse me. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God operates from the inside out. Your heart is the seat of all things. And your heart, and your here's how the kingdom of God is supposed to operate. You're walking in fellowship with God. The word of God is given to you as a gift to navigate this world. The voice of God, the voice of God never violates the word of God. You're in fellowship with God. And one of God's great desires is to teach you how to see the kingdom of God correctly. In fact, a worldview principle is this. Everything you see in this world is defined by what you cannot see. Unseen forces govern the world that you can see. Everything in your life has been created and built by unseen realities. That's what the, the Bible teaches. I don't have time to develop. But your privilege is to see. So when you are born again, born again to the top, God now wants to teach you how to see correctly. So faith anchors you to this kingdom world, anchors you to the idea of, of uh, ideas, concepts, wisdom, revelation, knowledge. And as, as your mind is renewed, your heart comes alive and your heart and your heart and your mouth begin to synchronize and you begin to speak words that are from God. And those words begin to create the world that you live in. And if you begin to really track with the Lord, here's what happens. You begin to see realities and you begin to see truth in the eyes of your heart before you see them in the natural and what's on the inside of you begins to define everything on the outside of you. Genesis, uh, you see this pattern. What does he do with Abraham? Abraham, what does he do? He said, look out and see the stars, all these things. Why? He's trying to get, give him a vision of where he is going. Natural eyes. Jesus makes this statement. It's a fascinating statement. He said, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. So Jesus goes, oh, this is, this is not good. This is rough. You know, he even prays like, oh, you know, like if you can get me out of this one, I'm, I'm good. You know, but what does it say? It says, for the joy set before him. So what? He had an image of where he wanted to go. And that image defined his behavior, not the pain he's enduring. Not like that movie didn't even, it was great, didn't even come close to portraying what Jesus went through. That image on the inside of him caused him to see a place that he would eventually uh, create for humanity if he went through the difficulty of the cross. For the joy set before him, the image that was on the inside of him. His belief system defined the outside world. So the kingdom of God is an inside job, and it doesn't happen overnight. That's why you need to get delivered of wrong concepts, trauma, difficulty, pain, all this other stuff. And here's the great thing about revelation. Revelation gives you an understanding of what is not working in your life. And God is incredibly practical. So you go to work, and, you know, somebody says an offhanded comment, and just go, oh, you kind of look a little heavy today. And you're like, whoo, that really hurt me. And it was just an offhanded comment. You know, they were just joking. But it went in your heart, and your heart is now indicating to you trauma that needs to be healed. So it comes up, and now it's a place of divine exchange, or even better, me, not you. You go to the airline, and they're mean to you, nasty to you. 
you, 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 you respond. They reap what they sow. So you respond correctly. And you go, something's really wrong with me. So you get to identify what's on the inside of you. That is, but here's why it's so important to identify those things and deal with those things. Because they are defining your world unless they're healed. Okay, I am going to land the plane. Verse 5, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? Notice, Jesus expresses a principle by which he taught the kingdom of God. He would teach, I, this is very, very true for me as I, as I learn things from the Lord. He will show me incidents in my life, situations, natural things. He'll express natural things and he goes, hey, when this, when this took place or when you were taught this by your parents, this was how I was teaching you the kingdom of God. So he will express kingdom truth, often in parables. Part of the reason he did it in parables is because he only wanted the hungry to really understand. He's teaching truth, but he's actually revealing the deep things of that truth to only the hungry. That's why he would say, he who has ears, let him hear. He's not mean or cruel. He's just seeing who is really listening. So he expressed them that way, but, but that's not the highest level yet, though in a sense, if we're going to describe it like that, because you'll hear something he says here in a minute, and this is where we'll hit the punch in it. We'll pray for people here tonight. I've gone way over. Forgive me. How can these be things? And Jesus kind of, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know, and we testify what we've seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now catch this. If I have told you earthly things and do not believe, if I have told you earthly things and do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus, before he left the earth, he said to his disciples things like this. He said, I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. I think he came to earth and he was like, guys, I don't know if you understand this, but I was there when the world was created. I know everything about this world. I know what makes this world tick. I know I'll give you one little truth that will cause you for eternity to be marveled. Think about this, though, too. This is, this is why we need a detox of religion Amen. in America. He could only talk to them about earthly things because he had to so deliver them from all that stupidity they learned. And he wasn't coming against himself. He was coming against what had been taught to them. He created the law. He's for the law. He was created of what it became. So why is that important? Because you have to so be guarded to loving ideas about God that are not exactly God. I just kind of like it comfortable. Well, it's not always like that. I just, anyway, so it's all different weird expressions in America like that. People talking about things that have no earthly value. Sometimes, too, this is why if you're part of this, you should come in this room ready to, it's not perfect, ready to receive. Bring the faith level up because you're drawing on that corporate man of God. But here's what happens. If you come in with these different things, you got to kind of switch the things to, I want to teach about these deep things that I deal with this, the unforgiveness and the just, you know, this person mad at that person and this person don't have a marriage, right? You know? So we're down here. We should be going up here. It's the responsibility of people to be mature. But he, I think he, he was like grieved because he had lots of things he wanted to say. But he could only go down here. He could only teach out of natural things because it was where they were at. But his desire was, Matthew 13, to you it has been granted to know the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. 
and I will utter things hidden before the very foundation of the earth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. And he's not going to guide you into some truth. He's going to guide you into all truth. And it'll have to do not only with your life. It'll have to do with setting people free. It'll have to do with making life better for your company. It'll have to do with how to raise that child. And you're like, oh, my God. What am I going to do with this one? He's got answers. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the simplest answer is like, hey, I'd like to handle that for me, for you. You've done a great job of being mom, but you're controlling everything. Just hand that over to me. I'll take that one. You're doing everything you've known in the natural. Now, why don't you ask me what you should do with that one? It's as simple as that sometimes. And from that place, he gives us words like this. Well, think about what he said. If I've told you earthly things and you do not th- understand, how you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And what did he tell us to pray? Matthew 6.10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There are heavenly truths that would cause us to represent him really well in the earth and would be far, would cause us to display his brilliance that would make people wonder. You are the light of the world. You are the city set on a hill. Cities look like something. Cities have ways of governing. Cities have streets, avenues, systems of governing. All these different things exist in cities. All these things should exist with the people of God. We'll close with this, Isaiah 51. Verse 16, I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand I, that I might plant the heavens. Watch what he's saying there. I've put my words in your mouth. Words. I have covered you. How did he create the world? Through words. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I might plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. How does he plant the heavens on the earth? Through the words you speak. The words aren't just words. They're what you really believe. When you believe something and say it and declare it, it doesn't change God. It changes something on the inside of you because often if you're going to live by revelation, I, it's like daily. God will say something. I go, I, I know what you just said, but my mind is going like this. How would that ever happen? And he goes, just keep saying it and keep putting it in your heart. Keep releasing it from your mouth and you'll see it come to pass. And the Lord would say that the heavens are open for the people of God right now. I want my people not to fear not to worry, not to struggle. In the middle of crisis, in the middle of shaking, the Lord would say, shaking that's been caused by even my own people's prayers in the earth. I'm allowing entities to be shaken, and even in the house of God, the Lord would say, I'm allowing entities to be shaken so that what cannot be shaken, and that is my kingdom, will stand in the end. There's a gavel of righteous judgment judgments being released among my people and there's a cleansing happening in the house of God in America. I keep seeing this. I see Jesus. He keeps walking around and he's walking around with a mop right now in his house. He's cleaning his house. He's purifying his house and he's causing and he's allowing things to be shaken that we never thought would be shaken. But the Lord would say, know that you can stand firm in my kingdom. Know that you can stand on a solid foundation. Know that you can stand in a place that cannot be moved. So I invite you to stand with me as never before. If you've had difficulty standing, the Lord would say there is grace to come up and a grace to stand, grace to trust, grace to speak, because there is a grace in the earth, says the Lord. 
for my people to overcome and to unlock things that have not been unlocked in any previous generation. You'll see in the next season in America, the Lord would say, you'll see in America, you'll see the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the water covers the sea. You'll see fire. You'll see even as it was on the day of Pentecost. You'll see sounds and and the sounds of heaven and tongues of angels come upon the people of God. And there'll be meetings that start on a Sunday morning and will end on a Monday night because the glory of the Lord will come to America as never before. And there'll be a liberating thing that will happen. And the Lord says, don't lose hope and don't back off that which I've spoken. Decree a thing and let it be established to you in this season. If you don't know where to start, the Lord would say, open up your word and begin to read my word, digest my word, speak my word, align with other faith-minded believers. But the Lord would say, be careful of the influences you allow to come into your heart. For this is an hour where the enemy is working hard to steal the word for my people. But the Lord would say, there is a remnant that I've heard. There's a remnant that's joined together all across the earth. It's an invisible alignment between heaven and earth for believers across the world. And in this invisible alignment, my people, through prayer and declaration, are birthing heavenly realities. So now see the heavens open, not only in America, but over Europe, over South America, over the nations of the earth, it will be a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I will have the final word. I will have the final word. I will have the final word. Do not focus on what the enemy is doing. In fact, there is confusion in the enemy's camp. There is confusion in the enemy's camp. There is confusion and there is chaos in the enemy's camp. But the Lord would say, keep your focus and eyes upon me. In fact, there is a grace. There's a grace even in this room tonight for my people to stay focused upon me, to keep their eyes on the high prize. There's a grace that I'm releasing to open the eyes of your understanding, to touch your eyes, to give grace to stay focused on the high call to stay focused on the high call and come up higher to the heavenly places. For there are secrets and there are mysteries that I desire to reveal to my people. If you just receive this, why don't you just lift your hands? It's like raining in this room. It's just raining in this room. The rain is here. someone who can come and lead a song or something? I don't know if we can do that. I don't know. Sorry I didn't plan for that. It's raining in this room. Thank you, Lord. Just keep your focus on him. Across the room, let's worship the Lord.
raise your hands to heaven. Lazarus was dead, the Lord said to Mary, if you believe, you'll see my glory. And the Lord says, if you believe, if you'll push in, you'll see my glory in your home, in the car, it's going to happen at work, face-to-face encounters with Jesus. If you'll push in, if you'll lean in, If you'll believe, you'll see my glory. Supernatural wonders in your job, in your home, in your family, your children. The glory of the Lord, face-to-face encounters with him. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Abner's going to pray. And Abner will pray for everybody that's here, okay, if you want prayer. So we're talking about the best way to do this. So if you'll do me a favor, if you're on the sides, if you're on the sides, and you have to do this as quietly as we can, if we can just stack the chairs on the side, and then we're going to just kind of position ourselves around the room. If you're a couple, get together. Uh, if you're an individual, you can stand. But we're going to find just pockets through the room. And the biggest thing we need everybody to do is this. After Abner prays for me, you could stand in that foyer area, wherever. We're just going to get in spots. After he prays for me, if you'll just kind of remove yourself from that area so that he knows that he's prayed over you and we can keep allowing him to pray over people. Yeah. Okay. We'll help you. We'll help you. Okay. So if you do me a favor, if you're on the side, just stack the chairs and then just stay there. Okay. And have patience with us. It's a packed house, a lot of people to pray for. But if you'll be patient, we'll get to you. Abner will pray over you. And, uh, It'll be good. to the row that you were in without the chairs, okay? I know, just kind of get back into your row and then we'll go through.
just want to encourage this to the band, just keep playing. We don't need to sing anything, but just across the room, I just want you to encourage you now. Just focus on the Lord. I'm just uh, I'm just a delivery man here. But your focus uh, is on the Lord here. 2006, I was in Mexico City. And I think that day, I just bring that down just a little lower if you would. 2006, I was in uh, Mexico City. I think that day I prayed for people for like four or five hours. And it was a really powerful move of God. And uh, I got a word from the pastor that day. He said, you're going to go around the world. You're going to lay hands upon people. You're going to re release the glory of God. And there's going to be an assignment on you for impartation, transfer of the anointing. So... When I pray for you today, uh, it's not just me putting hands on you. There's actually a divine transaction that God wants to do. And I'm not uh, confident in my own abilities. I'm confident in the God who's called me. And I'm confident in what I've seen him do around the world repeatedly. And he's faithful. So I just want to encourage you, just put your focus on him. The coming weeks, lots of packages are going to be delivered. We don't jump and kiss the mailman. We thank the person who's given the gift. But I'm going to believe that it will be like Jesus laying hands upon you and everything that you would need of. And I encourage you, um, just a little adjustment to what Pastor Jeff said. Just You can keep staying in that place. We found over the years people receive much more even as hands are laid on them. Just after, just keep receiving. I encourage you as long as you can, just stay and just keep receiving in the room. And it's possible to just uh, kind of keep conversations and things down to a minimum because God wants to do a deep work in here. see again, I just see fresh oil, God dropping in this room. If you would just as a prophetic act of surrender, I just encourage you, just lift your hands all across this room. And I just want you to repeat this with me. Holy Spirit, I know you're here. I'm here to receive from you. Fill me afresh. Whatever you have for tonight. receive by faith whatever it looks like I give control to you Holy Spirit teach me your ways I don't have to repeat this I'm just gonna pray Lord thank you for the rain that's in this room thank you for hungry people and I ask you the laying on of hands and Whatever words you give, God, I ask, God, for it be like Jesus himself laying hands upon people, imparting, releasing everything they have need of. Thank you for your fire. Thank you for your oil. Thank you for revelation. There's a, there's a particular spirit of revelation in this room that God is going to give people ideas and wisdom from this night forward that are going to define their life in greater fruitfulness. There's words that are going to be given tonight that will mark you. There's breakthrough. There's healing. There's deliverance. Some of you, when you leave tonight, you'll feel like a thousand pounds have lifted off of you. Thank you for the angel of oil. Thank you for the angel that helps with deliverance. Thank you for the angel of peace. Thank you for the angel releasing God, releasing gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for opening people's eyes to see and to experience. 
Increase your power, Holy Spirit. Let your power come. Let your power come, God. Let your power come tonight in this room. In Jesus' name. I just also want you to know sometimes it takes me a while, and I don't, I'm just looking to see what God's doing in the room. I'll pray for everyone, so I might pray for somebody next to you that maybe go to the other side of the room. I'm just discerning, so here's what I want you to do. Just keep your focus on Him. I'm just following what God's doing in the room. Increase your power. Thank you that this is a night of power. Thank you that there's an impartation of Holy Spirit power. We welcome your angels as ministering spirits, God. Thank you for the electricity of God in this room. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. 